Welcome back everybody. Well, this video is just the beginning. The very first video that I have ever done at a manufacturer's facility. A tour, if you will, of a well-known brand. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If I seem a little tired, look at the time. Yeah. Almost three in the morning. Okay, three in the morning, and I just got done editing video. So forgive me if I look a little tired. I am indeed tired, um, but I love doing this for you guys. Kevin, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for opening doors to me and allowing me to film some footage of your new facility. Um, it was just so easy to talk to you, and um, I really, really greatly appreciate this opportunity, and hopefully we can do it again. Um, I have. I wish I would have had a little more time to cover more things, more aspects, and some of the things that you and I talked about um, behind the scenes that I did not record. Um, you are an encyclopedia of knowledge, something that I have also mentioned to someone else. Um, so it's so refreshing to know that someone like you exists in this industry. I hope you guys enjoy the tour of the Valve Audio Companies facility in Sarasota, Florida. I am tired. I am headed to bed. Please enjoy and leave me your comments if you want to see more of this type of content. This might be just the beginning of the direction in which I will be going over the next few months. I believe content like this video is something that needs to be done more often and that we never get to see. Pay close attention to a lot of the information that Kevin relays to us and some of the things that you and I never really discuss, things that are behind the scenes, challenges that manufacturers go through. It is very informative. If you enjoy this content, leave me your comment underneath. Let me know what you think and if you want to see more videos like this. Once again, Take care and please subscribe, guys. Subscribe. Until the next one. Enjoy the video. We are. He's gonna go over the back of the 450, 452, 452 IQ. IQs. This is the business side of the 452 IQ. He's gonna explain something. We're just mentioning they can be. They what we call a music block configuration. It can be run either as a stereo amplifier or as a mono amp. And the mono is not bridging, by the way. It's a circuit reconfiguration to run as a, a properly designed mono circuit. And so in this case. There are two switches that control the rewiring of the circuit to stereo or to mono. One down in the output sector area, one up in the input sector area. And the third switch allows you to select between the natively balanced mode of the amplifier or a single-ended conversion input mode for those who are using RCA cables. And then you have speaker connections, cards patented type for stereo left and right or for mono. Wow. All machine aluminum and uh, made in the USA. USA that's for sure. Definitely made in the USA. <laughs> made in the USA. <laughs> Very few companies are doing everything here now, so it's great to see that. Well, it's, it's an important thing, though, because when you when you have your source and your work close to you, you can detect when there are any changes happening to suppliers in a part or the performance of something, and you can react to it quickly. Mm -hmm. If you have it made somewhere else and shipped in in batches, you can wind up with 25 or 50 pieces that aren't right. But you know, in this case, every piece as it comes off the line, goes through test, goes for audition, and so we have a very close connection between the suppliers, the quality of the parts, and our own process to make sure that we hold things in a very narrow range around the sound that we designed in the prototypes. Interesting. I see that. Yeah, it's incredible uh, to look at. So you test everything out before and you audition it, I think you, uh, I've heard. Every single piece I audition personally before it's authorized to ship, whether it's a new piece or a repair piece or an upgrade piece, everything has to sound just so as well as measuring just so before it leaves. Wow. Okay, tight controls just to ensure quality control for all these buyers. Um, I've heard nothing but great things about the brand and how reliable it is. Um, I have owned the, as you know, the 450s and of course the Master and both of them are phenomenal pieces. Um, to me, you know, not being necessarily a person that has been doing tubes for a long time, 
I do have experience with different tube brands and uh, just love back, man, the look. I mean, it's just phenomenal, guys. I mean, look at this. I mean, you want eye candy? I know you guys, just go ahead and turn on your TVs right now, your 4K displays, okay? This is a 4K video I'm doing. Okay, turn them on. Take a look at this. A very close look. Doesn't it make you want to buy one of these things? Just looking at this? Just the looks. I mean, I'll buy them alone just the looks, of Kevin. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's that beautiful, man. The behind the scenes glass, that's the front panel getting ready for final polish to go onto a master preamplifier. And you can see it's not just a, a shell or a veneer, it's a very large, solid piece of, uh, of machined aluminum that we finish up with this high gloss, which you might call a lacquer finish, even though, of course, we don't use lacquer in the modern EPA controlled era, but it's like a synthetic lacquer. And uh, in this case, after the color coat goes down, we do the silk screening here, and then a clear coat layer goes over the silk screen so you can't feel it and you can't rub it off. It'll be on there for decades to come. There you go. Look, a big chunk of metal. There's no, course, like... That, uh, that gets backlit for the, the blue logo effect. So there's, no, uh, there's no shortcuts here. You know, everything here is just built to last, and the, the quality of the components, the beauty, again, Turn on your 4K displays, okay? I'm working here for you all, so just take a look at this. Look at the detail. I mean, look how pretty this is. It's just phenomenal, man. Inside those 450s you just brought in are eight of these each, which we refer to as modular output tube assemblies, or MODAs. And you can see that's a drilled pattern in a G10 board with silver-plated turret lugs that are used to make the connections to the parts. That Piece of hardware right there those are about a dollar a piece now our cost wow silver plated brass a dollar and, each uh, little tiny piece yeah. wow um and so it's a hand wired unit using g10 and the silver plated turret lugs as structural points for the connections and uh, in this case this is the kt88 assembly that mounts at the top of the chassis here and the coupling cap and the cathode resistor and so forth including the uh plasma shielded one for the uh, for the cathode, for the screen side rather I should say. And that was uh, just built yesterday by just one, of yesterday. Our, one of our people, Sharon Fordham. Wow, incredible. This then would be the power supply board for that same model. Wow. One of the things we tend to do here is not use large single capacitors but groups of smaller ones because the smaller parts have higher self resonant frequencies, they're just more live, they're more willing to jump with the music and to, uh, and to let, it, uh, let it sing the way it's supposed to. Brute force is often a bad choice. Yep, I see that. Wow. Everything you're saying, I'm just absorbing it all. That's uh, an input assembly for a 450S IQ. So from the side that you would normally see, the stereo mono switch on the front and then the, uh, I'm sorry, the mono, the uh, RCA XLR switch in the front, and again made the same way, custom drill G10 board with the uh, silver plated turret lugs everywhere, and all hand wired. Everything is hand wired, right? Yeah. So that's why a lot of this uh, quality control is phenomenal here. Tested, then evaluated after the fact, after it's all said and done, he takes the time to go to his uh, room, audio room, and begin to make sure that he feels it's sounding as it should. So here's a, what, a test? Uh, this is actually the production card. shows the assigned production number, customer, the feature set, the model. It will indicate by the time it's done everyone who does various parts of the assembly. And then on the back would be, when it reaches that point, um, the test results for all the parts of the circuit. And there are three possible test dates given here if it goes through additional changes as part of the auditioning process and the point where it gets signed off for initial auditions, final inspections, final auditions, gets serialized, and then it gets shipped. So every piece that goes has a history card like this. It's one of these early phases right now. This is gonna be a 170i when it grows up. What is right now your lead time? How long is it taking you to deliver product? Because I know we have a, an entire situation with COVID and parts shortages, and um, it is important for a lot of the viewers to know that if they buy a VAC product, what, what, it, what are they looking at? What's the delivery, more or less, times right now? It's How long is it? on the model. When you look at a statement product, they have you know, perhaps a couple of hundred man hours of assembly, person hours of assembly in them. So 
and they're, the queue is back ordered. These have been on order, I think, for about two months. Two months for these right now. That's, that's, the, that's the next gear coming off of that production line. Okay. Um, so statement series gear, probably two to four months. Two to four months. Master products, like a master preamplifier, and you can see there are three in production right here. Um, they're probably two to four weeks. That's not bad, actually. Um, that's not bad at all. I mean, two to four weeks. We're turning in about two weeks' time until we recently ran into an interesting problem. Speaking of the shortages, the wrinkled powder coat paint that we use on the transformer cans is suddenly no longer available. That paint is no longer <laughs> that, available. That paint is now on a two-month lead time, so we're oh looking at God. alternative paint formulations to keep that going without changing the appearance materially. But it, and the duration. shortages crop up here and there. I just ordered... Uh, production run of power transformers for us and the last order we had done was 11 months ago price of the transformers has gone up 32 plus percent transformer price so months. a third just for a power transformer Thirty-three percent. Thirty-two point four, I think it was just the price increase wow in 11 months the inflation that we're seeing is breathtaking yeah, I, and I, a lot more than you read about in the newspapers. I agreed. Yeah, no, and I understand. So a lot of the viewers, by the way, a lot of you guys are always complaining about price increases, constant price increases on some of these uh, electronics, audio gear that we all are very, very um, in love with. And he's just explaining to you their challenges from inside the factory. Right? We don't ever see this as audiophiles. We never talk about the price hikes that they're going through. Uh, but it is important that we keep that in mind, okay? It's a domino effect. It's a chain reaction. We get, of course, to pay more, but so do they, right? They have to pay more for the parts that they once got for far less money. So, unfortunately, it affects everybody. Um, and it is important that we bring awareness to that because we are we love to complain all the time, but we never think about the other side of the fence. Well, it, it goes by just, just raw pricing. For example, we use a lot of the quarter inch aluminum plate stock like on the 452 chassis and beginning about a year and a half ago um, I mean, normally you, or you order um, your, your aluminum specified to be flat and scratch free and so forth today you cannot go to any of our regular suppliers and get a guaranteed warp free scratch free piece of quarter inch or three eighths inch aluminum plate what they don't want to hear it. tell it to the hand Oh my God! So right and now, so wow! Not only has the price of the aluminum gone up by compared to pre-COVID, maybe two hundred percent, I think it is. Two hundred percent! Wow! That's a swag. Don't hold me to that. That's, okay. I have to look up the numbers for certain. But massive inflation on the metal. But at that, what comes in may be rejected. So in many cases, we have to go to ordering a thicker material and taking the time to have it machine plane down to a flat, smooth surface before we can use it. What used to be a normal commodity part is now a special production part with 50% more cost based on the volume to have the area to fly cut it down to make it flat again to make things like you know, these large sides on the 452s. So you're not getting... That, that has to be flat. That can't have a warp or a bend to it. So you're saying right now you have challenges when it the, comes to what you're receiving. The quality has been... Is distinctly less than it was two years It's ago. not even in the same uh, stratosphere as it once was. So you find yourself having to... Extra do a second to pass what are to, more perf to perfect what they sent you to begin with. That's it. So, so again, guys, some of the challenges here, um, and we're hearing it. We're hearing it from back from Kevin here. Uh, we have not even talked about the rest of the challenges from other aspects in the production line. Uh, this is just, I'm sure, at a high level what you're telling us. So I'm sure there is a lot more to talk about. Uh, well, I, I cringe over it too. We just did uh, in March, I think it is, roughly a five percent price increase. But with things behind the scenes going up, you know, in some cases 32%, it probably wasn't enough, but I really don't want to shock people either. Right, so right. So we're, we're absorbing a lot of that right now and believing it's going to work out in the end. But right. it's a challenging time. It is a challenging time. Um, COVID has definitely put a huge dent, huge dent on prices for every single brand out there. Um, we have to be mindful of that, okay? Uh, I am one of the biggest shoppers, as you know, of the ultra high end. By the way, I would love to have one of these in my room, and I know my viewers would love for me to get one of those, uh, a pair of these in my room. I know Greg Weaver, he loves uh, VAC. He, him and I have been corresponding for about, about, about three weeks, four weeks, and uh, he, uh, he's very, he just loves the sound with his Von Striker setup. He, he's, he said he's heard a lot of different amplifiers, and he keeps coming back to your stuff. He just 
he, I mean, the way he articulates, I wish I could just read some of the, uh, of the description of the sound and the qualities of, uh, you know, what you provide with some, with your electronics. I mean, he's so in love with Vac, I can tell you that. So you definitely have one, one hell of a supporter right there. Um, and, uh, and of course, me, myself, I love, you know, the sound and I love what it does. Um, but I am, of course, curious here to hear this, um, to be able to play with it. I hear it at shows, Kevin, and to be honest with you, one of the biggest criticisms that I've had in the past has been that every time I hear VAC, I hear it with Von Stryker. And um, unfortunately, every time I see these large rooms, I ne they never have streaming, number one. A lot of it is vinyl, which I get, okay? But I like to hear the product in different settings. So, sure. you know, I like to hear it with streaming. Uh, I like to hear it with uh, CDs. I know they have the ability to play. And that's my bad, by, by the way, Kevin, because I didn't bring my uh, thumbstick with some music. Um, I should have done that, and Greg brought it to my attention. So um, kudos What's to Craig for proposing that. For yeah, on. yeah. And I just, you know, I never had the chance to spend enough intimate times with this, the new statement pieces. I've only really spent time with uh, my own, the 450s which were phenomenal. Um, and so I know the sound is there. I know the quality, the presentation, the organic feeling is all there. But for me, I guess the proper way to assess a product is essentially living with it or spending sure. intimate time with it and understand what it does and doesn't do. Um, and, and shows, we get a rough draft, I feel, oftentimes. Well, show, shows give you a, a place to listen to things you might want to check into. Right. But they're unfamiliar rooms. No matter how impressive they may or may not be, uh, you have to feel sorry for some of the exhibitors. They come in, they have eight hours or 12 hours to put a system in a hotel room yep. and make it sound good. Yep. That can be a challenge sometimes. It can be a challenge. Um, so if you hear a bad sound at a show, you don't want to dismiss the product entirely. No. If you hear a, a great sound, sometimes that's just a unique function of that particular room and some serendipity. I've heard some things when I first began back in 1990. It impressed me at the first CES I went to. That sure didn't impress me when I got them in my own home. The speakers I'm referring to. Interesting. That was the, uh, you may not have been around at that time, they did, they did a CES in Chicago in the summer of 90, where they couldn't use the hotel rooms because of the fire marshal and some of the things going on in Chicago. Okay. So they built sound cabins on the convention floor using what amount to like office divider materials. Right, right. And what works well in an enclosure made of damping material sure. doesn't always work well in a live room. In a right. So, you know, always, um, it's great to be impressed at a show. We, we do them like trying to put on a Formula One race to make people really enjoy the experience, to be uh, enthusiastic about the performance and what it can do. If you can't show people what's possible, they won't know what they want or what they might want. Correct. But, you know, that's sort of like a Formula One event, but the Street M3 car or the 3 Series van, things like the 170i, are where most of us live that's where we put a lot of our effort. We do the costume object systems to try techniques, to try materials, it's a learning curve process, to take all the limitations off, see what's possible, and then see what you can learn from that into a, a more affordable product. Agreed. Uh, what's interesting is, I, I hear this fairly often now, is people say you only show at this brand in this big room, but at most shows we are in three or four exhibit rooms. Um, ranging all the way from the 170i up to the statement series. There's usually a Von Schweiker partnered room in there. Right. There is usually an Accora partnered room in yes. there. There's usually a Gershman Acoustics partnered room in there. We had gear in Chicago in um, um, American Sound from Canada's room with the big avant-garde uh, system. Um, Daedalus, Lampazade, there are different kinds of people we put the gear with. So it, we. Try not to just give you the giant room, the giant system. That's great. That's great. That's yeah. What people always remember. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, it is really the statement room. I mean, in many ways. Unfortunately, I mean, that is the largest uh, display for VAC and for Von Stryker, right? So the smaller rooms, I hate to say it, oftentimes get overlooked because of the size. Because but they are there. That was my point. They are. No, they are there. And you definitely showcase uh, your product. Uh, speaking of Acora, bringing, going back to your point about the rooms, um, you know, back in. Um, February of this year, I heard, I heard a Quora with the integrated, um, and I thought it sounded phenomenal. Uh, when I think about the Chicago show, Expona, they had room issues, they had challenges. Um, I thought that the presentation 
um, wasn't what it was at the floor audio. However, it ties back to what you said. The room is something that we don't ever, we seem to overlook. And the room presented challenges for our core acoustics. I know they had a fake wall, like a divider wall, wall. and that was terrible. And so that was one of the issues. But I do feel that um, it's something that needs to be noted and highlighted, um, the challenges that a lot of these exhibitors have um, and they have to do what they can. They're thrown into the room. Keep in mind, guys, um, these exhibitors don't have a week, two weeks to set up. Okay? They don't because, they, or, first of all, they get charged for the room. the cables and after they've been moved and transported right. and jiggled and jostled. And, and so there is so much they have to put together to give you the best presentation possible given their challenges. So when you hear at a show things that pique your interest, that should be enough for you to say, you know what, I'm interested in figuring this brand out and see if there's any models across their entire lineup uh, that could be applicable and could be within my budget. So when you go to shows, remember, you're not there to be, although it might happen, you might get blown away by a certain room, uh, but you're there to just sniff potential, raw talent. Where is it? And if you sniff it, better, better said it than that, then you should just do your homework at that point. Take it home, exactly. write notes, and say, you know what, I like this brand. It piqued my interest. I need to see what else it can offer or if there is a product that fits my needs. All right? So... This has been an incredible experience here. Thank you, uh, Kevin, for giving me the opportunity here, man, to show, you know, the new facility. As he said, guys, in case you're just joining, it's still work in progress. They just moved into this location. So this is going to be better laid out, I'm sure, um, as time passes. But, uh, yeah. So Thank you for everything, guys. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. And, uh, Kevin, sure. once again, thank you. Always a pleasure. Until the next one, hopefully you enjoy this, guys. More to come here at Jay's Audio Lab. Peace.